Welcome to the Freedom School, an opportunity to learn about history-bending campaigns and initiatives from across the globe. We are inspired by what the Freedom Schools meant during the Civil Rights Movement in the United States, a place for alternative learning for African Americans, a safe space to discover suppressed stories of courage under oppression, the wisdom of culture, and the determination of many to make the impossible seem inevitable. This Freedom School is part of Spadework, a program that seeks to nurture and develop a new generation of organizers committed to those same principles. Learning about the historical context of these important campaigns and movement initiatives allows us to reflect more deeply about our own current challenges. Inquiring and learning is part of the organizer's space. Organizers are inspired by the people we meet and the stories we share with each other. We also know that this journey never ends, and along the way we find joy and satisfaction in practicing the proven organizing adage. Listen with an open heart to the lessons others have learned and apply what you think makes sense. Then reflect, rinse, repeat. If you are inspired by what you hear, or if you want to support the development of a new generation of organizers through spade work, then consider making a small contribution to keep this going. Go to www.spadework.school backslash donate right now, or simply click on the link on the chat screen. Enjoy your time together. Adelante. Good morning, good afternoon for some folks. I know we have folks joining from all over the place. Um, and welcome, I'm so excited to be here. My name is Alex Muhammad. I am born and raised in Chicago and I currently work as the political training director for the Mass Liberation Project. Um, in this space today for Freedom School, I will be co-host along with Larry, who I'll pass it to you to introduce yourself in a second. Um, but connected to the Freedom School, which we're participating in today, we recently launched what's called Spade Work, uh, which is a eight month intensive campaign development and training support cohort uh, for organizations and organizers who are on the front lines of responding to systemic racism. Um, I'm really excited to be digging into this conversation today and welcome to our first Freedom School. Thanks, Alex, and um, welcome everybody. My name is Larry Solomon. I teach um, longtime instructor at uh, the College of Ethnic Studies, specifically the, the Department of Race and Resistance Studies at San Francisco State. Um, also a longtime trainer in organizing, uh, specifically using history um, to uh, introduce new organizers to movements past you know, not so far past, sometimes, you know, further into the, into the decades. Um, I, I really, I'm so excited to, to help launch this, uh, this next 10 weeks. And in fact, just a little bit more, um, Alex talked about spade work. Freedom School is part of spade works program, part of the mission. Um, and just a little bit more about what we're going to be doing now, starting today for the next 10 weeks, um, we're going to profile, um, key movement moments, key historical moments, uh, profile campaigns that altered the course of history, um, not so much as an academic exercise. Um, I teach at a university, but I try not to think of myself as an academic. We're teachers, but we're also um, in community here. So we're gonna have a bunch of voices in the next couple of hours talking about um, some really interesting history. And so for the next uh, 10 weeks, we're going 50, 60 years ago, and we're going just a few years ago, we're going to have some really great um, upcoming uh, episodes, for lack of a better term, and I'll kind of introduce some of those at the end of, at the end of our session today, but um, I do want to also acknowledge, um, and you heard his voice in that video introduction, um, Spade Work and Freedom School are the brainchild of Francis Calpatura. Um, many of you know. I, I raise up his name for a couple of reasons. One, he gave me a lot of money to say nice things about him today. Um, you know, maybe not that much money. He 
But anyway, Francis also um, in that introduction kind of made a really interesting point about the purpose of Freedom School. And I just want to again amplify that idea. Um, he said that learning from past victories, as well as learning from past mistakes um, and being inspired by the efforts of the past um, is critical for the development of, of organizers. Organizers learn from doing, but they also learn um, from these histories. And so that's what Freedom School is all about. And that's what we're going to try and accomplish over the next 10 weeks. Just a real quick programming note. We are live streaming on YouTube. I always wanted to say that uh, we're live streaming on YouTube. Um, and YouTube is also, we're going to have a YouTube channel for spade work and freedom school. So that's where um, these are going to live. They're going to be archived there. Uh, just give me a minute here to lay out the format for what we're going to now experience. Um, in a minute, we're going to bring on our main presenter and throw it to our guest, Prexy Nesbitt, um, who will be talking about the history of the anti-apartheid divestment campaign in the United States. Um, Prexy is going to help lay out some of the context, highlight some of the key lessons from that era of movement work. Um, we're also going to be devoting a pretty good chunk of the session to question and answers. So please, I implore all of you, uh, use the chat to contribute your questions, your insights, your comments. Um, our folks here, our team here at the Freedom School will sort through them and we'll try to um, give them the light of the day in the second hour when we have our Q&A with, with Prexy. We've also asked a couple of respondents um, who are current participants in the program to share their reflections um, on what they have just heard, but also kind of connecting those lessons from the past to their current work. And uh, I think finally, before we, uh, like I said, before we close the session, we'll preview next week and the weeks beyond. Um, Alex? Thanks, Larry. Um, yeah, so now we wanna actually introduce Prexy Nesbitt. Um, we're so grateful for you to be joining us today. Uh, Prexy is currently the president, uh, a presidential fan fellow, sorry, um, in peace studies at Chapman College and was one of the key uh, leaders, like Larry said, in the anti-apartheid movement in the United States. Um, and one of the roles that Prexy played was as coordinator of the committee to um, oppose bank loans in South Africa. Um, so yeah, I would love for Prexy, can you, can you join us? Thank you for being here. There we are. Happy. Can you hear me? Yes, I can I'm hear very you. Very happy to be here with you. Good, good. We're happy to have you. Um, where, where are you calling us from today? Or where I'm are you calling today? you from in uh, Orange County in Tustin, which is right near Chapman University. Gotcha. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the work and what you're up to now? I certainly can. I'm, uh, I'm specifically appointed to do work with peace studies and the history of uh, struggles in Africa, especially Southern Africa, and the history of anti-racism work in the United States and how they uh, match up with each other. And part of that, when I get a chance, is that I will be taking people to the region, to Southern Africa, to South Africa, to Mozambique, to Namibia, when we get a chance. But right now, of course, the COVID uh, situation and the disparity between the rich countries having access to all of these um, vaccinations and poor countries in Africa not yet having those things, it's slowing up our chances to get to go there and learn and share with our brothers and sisters in those Southern African countries. I just, I wanna remind folks again to use the, the question and answer before we throw the, the session over to Prexy for his presentation, which we're gonna do in just a few seconds here. Um, you know, I, again, put your great questions. We will address them in, in good time, but without further ado, and again, on the history of the anti-apartheid divestment campaign in the United States, uh, here is Prexy Nesbitt. Prexy, it's all yours. Thank you, Larry. And thank you very much, Alex, both of you. I'm very, very honored to have the chance to share with you. And I'm particularly grateful to Spade Work and to my longtime friend, Francis, for 
the opportunity to talk. I really like a slogan that I saw that you all use in spade work. It's called listen, rinse, and repeat, because it reminds me so much of something that we learned uh, in, in, in starting out this work of anti-apartheid work and solidarity work with the Southern African liberation movements. One of the people who was one of our great teachers was the Emil Cabral. And Emil Cabral was from Guinea-Bissau. And Cabral used to say to us all the time, study the situation, know the situation, listen to the people, talk with the people, find out what, this, what, their, are, what their issues are and never forget that and never depart from listening as a base of doing that work. And I wanna share with you all that there's a wonderful new resource that's been done by a woman that some of you may know, Imani Countess and her colleague, Bill Minter, that's a book, a new work online about solidarity. And I think that was one of the first things we had to do was to find what are the points of solidarity where we can work. And so one of the things that we found, particularly in doing anti-apartheid work, was to find that there were these places where the racism of Southern Africa and the racism in the United States came together and reinforced each other. And so one of the slogans we had in the campaign to end bank loans in South Africa was a slogan, red line South Africa and not Chicago, red line South Africa and not Oakland, red line South Africa and not New York City or LA. And it was that position of, of, of blanking out South Africa and its apartheid system and not and, and ending the systematic racism of banks refusing to give loans in the United States. This was a starting point for particularly the work of the bank campaign, the campaign to end bank loans that were going from US banks to the apartheid regime and financing things like them buying weapons, financing things like helping to make South African apartheid government a nuclear power. These were important starting points that we felt were ways that you could reach out to people in the United States to have them really get engaged in this campaign to isolate the South African apartheid system. Now, I wanna say from the beginning that the campaign was never just bank loans to South Africa. It was also things like getting people to stop buying the gold coin called the Kruger Rand. It was things like stopping uh, schools and, uh, pension funds from investing in companies that were doing business in South Africa, like Shell Oil Company. And you, we had then what was called the divestment campaign, which became huge all over the entire country. We had material support campaigns, uh, raising money for the African National Congress in South Africa, raising money for the Mozambique Liberation Front. These were all also part of the overall rubric of the anti-apartheid movement of, of, of this movement that had really, I think, as much significance as the civil rights movement had in the United States, but it's just not known. And there was no divorcing the two. It's not accidental that when Trans Africa, the organization headed by Randall Robinson out of Washington, DC, when they started doing the weekly daily demonstrations against the South African embassy in Washington, DC, it's not an accident that some of the leading civil rights figures all were walking that picket line outside of that embassy. And it became, out of all of that came what was called the Free South Africa Movement and there were demonstrations across the whole country against any installations that represented consular places for the South African government. And those demonstrations grew and grew 
and they all became what was called the Free South African Movement. Now there was at the same time going on also uh, direct solidarity, direct support, raising money to give to the African National Congress, to give to the MPLA in Angola, to give to the Mozambique Liberation Front in Mozambique. And we saw all those struggles as they did in Africa as indivisible, as very related one to the other. And I think the other thing that we must put forward too is that these were, we were part of an international movement. The anti-apartheid movement was duplicated in Canada. We regularly met with people from Canada. We met with people from England. We met regularly with people from Japan, with people from Jamaica, with people from Ghana. This was all part of the international anti-apartheid movement. And let me hit a couple of other points. And then I want us to see some footage so that you get a sense of what this looked like physically. I'll come back to these points, but I think there are two that I'd like to hit for a minute. One that I'll come back to is that we struggled with doing multiracial work in a racially polarized world. That's point one, number one. Number two is that the anti-apartheid activists that were doing this work, they're still at it. I think one of the first things we learned was that was not to be sprinters. We weren't sprinters. We were doing long distance work and we realized that. And so it's not accidental. But so many of the people who did anti-apartheid work are still at it, still doing the progressive work that needs to be done throughout the world. I think if we could look at a little bit of a film that's been done recently about coming from Nelson Mandela's visit to Chicago, I think it will help give us a basis, a visual basis for this. The connection between Black Americans and Black South Africans goes back to the 1800s. There were African Americans in South Africa uh, as early as 1819, and they were there as sailors. A major part of the commercial trading sailor network was African American. That early group of people, you know, were treated differently than black South Africans, but they still recognized what was going on in terms of the way that black South Africans were treated. The enslaved sailor on the left traveled to South Africa on this Confederate ship called the Alabama. There's even a South African song dedicated to the ship. Sailor Yankee Wood was a ship steward before settling in South Africa after the Civil War. Wood made money during Johannesburg's gold rush in the 1880s and purchased hotels. In 1890, musician Orpheus McAdoo and Virginia's Hampton University Jubilee Singers spent five years in South Africa performing show tunes and spirituals. Coming for to carry me Hope oh, 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 If you get there before I do Coming for to carry me home By the early 1900s, Black Baptist and African Methodist Episcopal churches sent missionaries to live with South Africans to teach the Bible and care for orphans. The AME church began to be banned inside South Africa because the South African state began to see them as encouraging opposition to the way that uh, black South Africans were being treated. And black newspapers and magazines such as the Indianapolis Freeman, The Colored American, and Marcus Garvey's Negro World circulated in Johannesburg, espousing a message of black liberation. There were some Garveyites inside of South Africa, uh, even though it too was a banned organization. Given these historical connections, it's not surprising that when the offspring of enslaved African Americans moved north to Chicago as part of the Great Migration, they strongly identified with black South Africans who were forced to live under a strict system of racial separation and inequality called apartheid. It's a horrible system that defines people. 
as superior or inferior on the basis of how they look. So you don't care about the content of the people. And because we are inferior, everything for us has to be inferior. Fast forward to the 1970s when black South Africans started coming to Chicago regularly. I made a list the other day of the um, 78 different South Africans who stayed in my house on the west side of Chicago. In 1973, there was a conference held here uh, at Dunbar High School. It was a founding of an organization called uh, the National Anti-Imperialist Movement in Solidarity with African Liberation. One of the speakers was Oliver Tambo. That was an electrifying experience. Oliver Tambo preceded Nelson Mandela as president of the African National Congress while living in exile for three decades. It was only after Nelson Mandela was released from a life sentence for plotting to overthrow the white racist government that Tambo was able to return to South Africa. It, it was a learning experience to actually speak to people who had actually been on the ground in South Africa and who had uh, experienced uh, pretty much some of the same things that I had experienced growing up in the South. And there were so many public forums and educational activity and a constant thrust of keeping the eye on this brutal regime of a minority European descended population in control of a majority black country that, that just seemed uh, outlandish in the minds of, of everyday people. Here in the Chicago area, we have 21, 22 different anti-apartheid organizations. We had a committed grouping of people who were very versed in the relationship and how it all came together with the struggle in this country and the struggle in Southern Africa. What I'm talking to people about Southern Africa is to make the connections between what's going on in Chicago and what's going on in Southern Africa. We in Chicago have always had a diversity of movement building in relationship to the injustices that that black people have had to fight. You had the center of the Nation of Islam here. You had the center of the National Baptist uh, Convention here. You couldn't have had more opposites, right? But it's the people, how they dedicated themselves to our struggle as if they were experiencing the pain and the hurt of the people of South Africa. Of course, I suppose in some way, it was easier for them since they were not so free after all. We would say free in South Africa is free in ourselves. It was indeed that. It was very much, as has been just indicated, a process that the struggle against South Africa and apartheid was also a struggle against systematic racism in the United States. And it was very, very, very evident for people who got involved. It wasn't always easy. Uh, there were times, for example, we mentioned that there were in Chicago alone some multiple 10, 15, 20 different groups doing work. There were church groups, there were union groups, there were community groups. There were black groups, there were white groups, there were Latino groups. Uh, it, it led to struggle sometimes. It was, it was tense. Sometimes people didn't work together well at all. And so one of the things we struggled with uh, was, was working with each other toward the goal of ending apartheid and ending U.S. support to apartheid. And that was not always an easy process to work out how we would work together. In the organization that I was very involved in founding called the Coalition for Illinois Divestment from South Africa, we developed a principle. We had a principle that though we were a multiracial group, 
we would always function under black leadership on this question of ending apartheid and providing solidarity to uh, the people struggling in Southern Africa. And I think one of the things that, that helped us was the fact that we had a model that was given to us of Southern Africa, of multiracial work in the South African context. In South Africa, they had something we didn't have. We don't have in the United States, even to this day, something like the Freedom Charter that's a part of the South African governance structure. And that Freedom Charter says, South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white. And that was a principled position. And so it influenced us. Uh, it influenced it and, and groups that didn't normally work together started working together. I think we were also very influenced by a character that came out of the Mozambican struggle for freedom from Portuguese colonialism. And that character was somebody called Jica Nyoka. And Jica, I hope I'm not talking too fast for my comrade interpreters, but Jica Nyoka was a hustler. He was slimy, he was no good, and he was presented as a cartoon figure, as somebody that we did not want to have in the movement, to have slime and, and hustling, taking advantage of the movement. And so in that respect, I think we, we, we got good lessons out of the struggle being waged on the African continent. And it went the other way as well. There was tremendous amounts of people who gained a great deal of information from coming and interacting with us in the context of our struggle here in this country. And so there was all these different types of campaigns that took place. There was the campaign to get rid of the gold coins. There were the divestment campaign, the campaign to stop people from investing in companies that were in, in giving money and providing capital to the South African system. There was the campaign against bank loans. Those banks like say Chase and First National in New York, Citicorp, these banks were big at giving loans and we forced them. It was the bank, the, the campaign to oppose bank loans that forced those banks to stop lending. And then that all, all these activities and including the demonstrations against the South African consulate all lead to the passage in 1986 of the Comprehensive Sanctions Bill by the US Congress, which Reagan vetoes, but the momentum that we had going in the country was so great that they overthrew the veto that Reagan had imposed. Then one of the things that I think was one of the crowning wonderful moments of this whole struggle was when the great Congressman from Oakland, Ron Dellums announced to the world that the veto vote had been taken and that Reagan had been defeated. And so this was a major, major development when the United States passed the Comprehensive Sanctions Bill and led to many other Western countries taking their money and their capital out of supporting the apartheid system in South Africa. There's another kind of group, and I will we'll look at a bit more footage, but another group that's to be saluted in all of this, and another principle that we adopted was that of working with institutions that would go with making pressure, isolating the apartheid regime. And US churches did a particularly good job, some US churches. And the other body was the World Council of Churches, which began giving direct support 
to the liberation movements. Uh, it wasn't support for them to, to do the armed struggle, but it was support for them to, 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 to pro provide material aid to their cadres and to their members. It was very important symbolic support that came. And that was related to the support that people started giving to liberation movements, ordinary people making contributions to the African National Congress, ordinary people making contributions to Namibia's Southwest African People's Organization. This was, I think, an important step that we reached. And that was that moment when just ordinary people began to learn about, to follow, and to support this freedom struggle overseas that was so related to the struggles here in this country. And that's why Nelson Mandela makes two major trips to the United States, one in 1990, another a couple of years later, to thank the people of the United States. So let us take another look, if we can, at some of this incredible film footage from Mandela in Chicago. We started out as a small group of individuals, residents of Chicago, who were able to create First of all, legislative changes. We really were able to get our governments, local and state governments, to divest money from South Africa. It doesn't mean that there weren't down moments, that there weren't moments where it was sort of a grind, that there isn't some disappointment in what's happening in South Africa and how their problems, some of their problems are so magnified now, you know, that they are having such difficulties. It doesn't mean that I don't have hope that they can continue to develop into a more egalitarian and, and, and safe society, you know, but I want that here too, right? There are studies that show that African Americans still suffer from the effects of slavery and discrimination. And we are more than 200 years past that. South Africa has been at it for 24 years. It's been a terrible disappointment to all of us that whites still own so much of the land, that they still control so much of the economy, not just because they're white, but because it's oppressive, unjust, and unfair, and because it makes for an economy that still oppresses Africans. Victory continues in South Africa. The struggle is still certain because some of the major changes that needed to be made have just not yet happened. Black South Africans, in many ways, in terms of the conditions of their lives, haven't experienced a lot of change. But what they have now, that they didn't have before, is the opportunity for that to happen. We wanted to show our children that the world was bigger than the west side of Chicago. We felt that was so important so that they could have a concept of the world because we never know where our children will be or what they can achieve. Each new generation contributes to the ongoing kaleidoscope of victory. Each loss contributes ultimately to victory. It's a process that continues all the way. And that we, it's one that we can be utterly proud of. It is all credit to the work of many decades that people had done under such inclement weather as Chicago has with your hawk. And people were still going out canvassing in support of our struggle. The work that was done in the States is just so monumental. It needs its own history. I think we could uh, maybe open up. Uh, uh, I'm guided by Francis in this question. And I think the only other point that I would like to make at this, at this juncture is, is the point that was made by uh, Cheryl speaking in the film. And that was that 
that, that, that victory is a, a continuous process. It's not a one-time event, but that victory is ongoing. And that in this, we have learned, I think, out of the anti-apartheid work, and the work of solidarity with the Southern African struggles. And Cheryl says it well, that it's still a big struggle to get real change, to get equity for everybody in South Africa and Mozambique and Namibia and those countries like it is in our own country. And it's all part of victory being a continuous process. They say in, say in Mozambique, a victoria continua. Victory continues. It is not a one-time affair. And so we need long distance runners. As Robert Van Lirup says in this wonderful film that came out in that period, the film Aluta Continua, as he says there, we're not sprinters, that we need long distance runners people who are in it for the long haul. I'm ready, I think, at this point to open up and see if we have some questions and reactions, Larry, if that makes sense to you, please. Absolutely. Thank you, first of all, Prexy. That was, that was something. That was inspiring. Um, you know, I, I was coming up kind of politically around the time when, um, you know, it was right before Mandela and the others were released in 1990. So it was like late eighties. And, you know, a lot of people can talk about their political coming of age or their understanding of the bigger issues of global context. And South Africa had a lot to do with, with um, my understanding how white supremacy was a global force and how capital was this powerful force that that oppressed but also i was so inspired then and just now again by you know how local people there and here but how local people even in the united states could help impact um what was happening on the ground 10,000 miles away it, it really is I, I it's i don't have a particular question there i just wanted to kind of bring that up again, that um, this is a story about solidarity, but it's also a story about organizing. And the organizing that I'm kind of curious about is on the ground in Chicago, in the Bay and other parts of the, of the country, especially doc community, support communities. Um, there was this divestment campaign. There was a, an effort to connect with local organizers. I'm kind of curious about, well, two, maybe it's a two part question. So forgive me if it's a little convoluted, but one is, did you all get some blowback, some grief from local organizations who said, why are we spending time on an issue 10,000 miles away when we got so many issues here? And then the other question is, um, what were the ways that you might have engaged with unions and, and others in that sort of fight around, around global capital? Those are excellent questions. And of course, we, we had to develop uh, we, we had to learn things as we developed answers to those questions, responses to those questions. Um, we learned that it was important to know who were, who were the people who had done the organizing in particular areas and how do we get to meet them and how do we get to meet the, the leaders and the people who were do, dealing with the day-to-day -day issues let's say in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. and how we could talk with those leaders and get them to see the relationship of those struggles in South Africa to their struggle in the Bay Area, let's say in Oakland. And it was a process. Uh, I remember, and, and sometimes it was really hard. I remember first time I ever tried to do a community meeting on South Africa and showing a film called Last Grave at Dimbaza on the west side of Chicago at a Catholic school. The temperature that night was 30 degrees below zero and three people came out to see this film. Me, a cousin who had no choice and the nun that opened the doors for us to come in there. 
And she felt so bad for us that she just stayed and watched the film. But now that's 1970. 20 years later, I would be there when Mandela would be thanking an audience of close to 2,000 people when Mandela would speak at the Plumbers Hall, at the Plumbers Union Hall. And the plumbers in Chicago, I don't know about Oakland, but they are some of the most reactionary people on the face of the earth. And here they were all cheering for Nelson Mandela. That's, that's years of patient work and presenting the issue and tying the issue in to what people are dealing with every day in their realities in this country. And that was, that was a process. There's no shortcutting that process. Um, and I think in that process too, the other thing we had to often contend with was uh, dealing with our own racial tensions with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, th that film mentions that we were in the city of uh, a very strong nationalist groupings. Uh, in the beginning, Farrakhan and those people, they didn't want nothing to do with working with any white people on this question. And the, the groups that were integrated groups just kept at it. They kept sledging away at it. We had to knock on doors where white people wouldn't even open the door if there was a, a black person standing with a white person outside. Um, all of that took many years of work to do. Patient, patient, organizing work. And I think that that has proven itself to be very important because the other thing it then fed into was also the election in 1983 of Harold Washington as the mayor of the city of Chicago. And I had the great pleasure to work with Harold Washington as a special assistant. And I remember him saying to me one day, he said, Nesbitt, I sure am glad to have you working with me because I sure don't want you working against me. Mm -hmm. But this is the same man who would later, would later before his death, welcome SWAPO freedom fighters to the city hall of Chicago with you know, some of the most racist people in the world shaking the hands of freedom fighters from Namibia. So I think this, it's all about the, the long, hard trek you have to do to make organizing pay off. I, I, I wanna amplify that point and then I throw it to Alex, if she, Alex has a comment or question too, and then we'll open it up to the Q&A from, from our audience. But that point about this long haul, I, I'm just so struck by that image of three people watching this film <laughs> and then 20 years later, what you just described is is such a is such a leap. So I like the idea of long distance as a theme here. Long distance in terms of U.S. and South Africa, physically, geographically, but also this long organizing marathon, which is one of the points we we raise in organizer training all the time. Like that's the, the big moments, the big celebrations, the, the marches, the the dramatic kind of events. Those are the things that typically get talked about in kind of mainstream history of, of the of the tell, but. I, I appreciate the, 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 the slow kind of respectful work that, that gets done. Um, Alex, saw you. Alex, just before you say anything, let me just mention one other quick thing. Mm -hmm. There's a film done by a Oakland Berkeley filmmaker, Ain't Gonna Play Sun City. Mm -hmm. And it's a film about, I think her name is Connie Fields. And it's a film about one of Mandela's visits. And on that visit, there was, great difficulty because Mandela was the new president. So many of people in this country wanted Mandela to speak to the situation of African Americans in the United States, and he didn't. He didn't. He came as the president. He didn't speak to that. He was also being attacked because he was going on to Cuba, so he was being attacked for that too. But he comes to Oakland, to the stadium at Oakland, and at Oakland he makes this long intervention about Native Americans, incredible description of Native America. And in the film afterwards, you see this Native American woman start crying. 
just remembering that Mandela had spoken to her situation. It's just one of the most beautiful things. And Mandela spoke to that situation. And in doing that, I think he was really also speaking to the African Americans as well, because he just, he saw no separation between those two struggles. I'm sorry, I just wanted to throw that in because it's such a wonderful thing for people to take a look at. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. And I, yeah, I absolutely have questions. Um, so yeah, my... Uh, it's always super inspiring and helpful for me to piece uh, history and just information together, um, particularly being Chicago native. Um, and also my, my great grandfather was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So I grew up um, in the black Muslim community in Chicago. Uh, my grandfather was WD um, and my dad is the second. And so, but I come into this space in this conversation as um, a student of organizing, an organizer. Um, and my the first question that came to mind for me is just, what was, can you say a little bit more about your particular role in the movement and those responsibilities? Um, and connected to that, what were some of your biggest personal challenges and then the lessons that came out of that? Let me say that uh, I was very fortunate, Alex, because A, I came from a family that had great consciousness. My, my father and his four brothers all were raised in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Uh, his mother insisted that they all go to college. They all did, they all became professionals and they all had a, a philosophy of give back that despite them having all gotten these degrees and stuff that the principal in our family was give back. We read, they read, uh, Elijah Mo I mean, they read the uh, Garvey's newspaper all the time and, and talked about it in Champaign where they were the newspaper boys. That's what one of the things they did. And they, uh, very early, they sent me, they supported me going to study in Tanzania in 1965. And so I got an exposure that was very fortunate. That was my school. I didn't learn about Africa in the United States, although I went to a school that they did some real teaching about Africa. And we, we all sang occasionally, uh, lift every voice and sing as part of uh, the school that I went to. That was very unusual in Chicago. But uh, I, out of Africa and going to school in Africa, I then began to meet South African, my roommate, had walked, literally, had walked out of South Africa all the way up to Tanzania. That's a four or 5,000 mile journey. Hmm. And he arrived with just four or five pieces of clothing. I arrived with a, a, a big old trunker or trunk of clothes and all this stuff for a year. And I was, I was embarrassed that here this man was, had done so much. So that was the beginnings for me, Alex, of saying uh, this is about more than me just getting a college education and making a big salary. Uh -uh. It was about how do we give back? That was, in my family, a very important principle. We, we were on the west side. You, you come in from Chicago, you know about the gap between the west side and the south side. We stayed, my parents, they're doctors and lawyers and all of my family, but they stayed on the West side. There was a time that the two doctors in my family were the only doctors who had off, who were in Lawndale. There were no, there were no doctor's offices in Lawndale. Oh, and many of the black bourgeois doctors had all moved to the South side. But give back was the principle. They were what, what uh, Imani Perry, that great writer, she's done all the work on Lorraine Hansberry and stuff. She used to say they were race people. And that then also carried over to me being very conscious of the people that I met who trained me and taught me about things having to do with South Africa and with connections. Um, 
I met very early the Sisulu family, wonderful family of people who are just like African-Americans. They're a blend of all kinds of color. Walter Sisulu though, is one of the greatest leaders in the country. And his wife, Albertina, uh, also very early, the principal was introduced to me of, look at who the women leaders are, you know? And then finally, for me, I'll stop at this, Alex. I went to a church on the west side. It was a little tiny church, but a congregational church at Madison and Albany. It doesn't even have a plaque right now that says, this is where King was based, but that's where the King movement was based because the big churches on the South side, black churches didn't want King there. They were scared of daily. All those things fed into how, and I brought many leaders to that church. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, I, um, I want to just kind of set up this next piece because we're going to go to audience questions and then we want to alternate a little bit to um, a couple of respondents who, who um, are going to try to sort of place this in, in context to, to the organizing work that they're doing now. But um, lift up a few questions here. Uh, the first one is from Domenici um, and, and, and it's a, a question that sort of assumes something, but it's an interesting one. Do you think or why do you think if it's true it may have been easier for some folks in the US to come together to combat apartheid in South Africa, but not tackle the issues of structural racism in the United States. Was that true? Uh, did you find that in your experience, talking to some folks more than others? Um, can you talk to that, that maybe that tension a little bit? Well, certainly it was a tension, but I don't think it was as true as people would like to think that it was true. And certainly it was not at all part of the active program of people who were doing the organizing. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, we were always looking for ways to integrate the two struggles yeah. more because that we knew that down the road, that's how it would pay off was to see people, to help people see the connection between the two struggles on both sides, both in terms of people in South Africa and people in the United States. Now, there were certainly those people who would like to say and attack us by saying, well, look at them. They're doing all that work for those black people over there on the other side of the ocean, but they don't do no work here for us in this part. They don't do any work for Latinos. On the contrary, we tried to make connections to as many struggles as possible. And that's one of the reasons why I would say the people who did this work, like the people interviewing, they're still doing the work. They're yeah. still doing the work and seeing the connections. And they, they know they aren't going to get any material gain. Out. None of them are going to be multimillionaires. None of them are going to be Gates or something like that. And, and <laughs> we were, how do you do principled social change work all your life? was one of the lessons that <coughs> we were hearing again and again. And the people that we met often were doing that. Now, part of one of those commentators by the woman in the film, I think Rachel Rubin, we got very disappointed by the South Africa that emerges right after, nine, after the elections in 1994, and particularly under the leadership of Zuma. But then again, we said, well, we've been here before. We come from Chicago. So we know what corruption is about. So we just have to fight that corruption in South Africa, just like we fight the corruption in Chicago. Uh, another question from someone we'll hear from soon, <coughs> Shamaya Bird, um, asks about how supportive schools were in the divestment campaign and how supportive unions were. And I think the school part might be in two pieces, right? Because you all targeted institutions like universities, but were there other um, schools or, you know, educations of even higher learning that, that offered support as campaigns went along? And then can you talk a little bit about the unions um, in, in more detail? Sure. I, I think that uh, on the schools question, 
there were certainly schools that uh, would never go along with divestment. And some of them would be a big surprise. For example, Oberlin College mm -hmm. in Ohio, history of work with the Underground Railroad in yeah. the United States, right. history of bringing black students to that college, it never divested. Hmm. It never divested. And coming into all this, assisting schools to avoid divesting was what was called the Sullivan Principles that were enunciated by a black minister by the name of Leon Sullivan, who put to, he, he got appointed to the board of General Motors, a big investor in South Africa. And so he enunciated some principles, he said, which would enable the US companies to stay in South Africa. Well, we saw this as camouflage right away. And one of the things that we organized, it was very important, <coughs> excuse me, was we organized a summit conference of black religious leaders held in New Jersey, put together by a wonderful minister by the name of Willis Logan from the National Council of Churches. And those ministers came together and they, re, in, they denounced Leon Sullivan and the Sullivan principles. And he, whereas he had all these principles that would allow companies to remain in South Africa and making profits and sustaining apartheid, they announced one major principle, freedom, an end to apartheid. All the, and, they, and they rejected him. Mm. And that was the beginning of the end of the role of those principles. So I think that was a very important uh, point to also talk about. Now you said another, your other question was. Well, you know, I'm, I'm mindful of some of the recent campaigns in the BDS campaign, to isolate state of Israel. Right, right. How local organizers, you know, I mean, I'm fascinated by this question around how local organizers have an impact on global affairs. And um, local Palestinian and, and other human rights organizers who are trying to isolate some aspects of Israel, like how do you, you know, do you get universities and institutions to divest? Do you work with unions, uh, longshore workers uh, to maybe not offload goods on a ship that comes from, you know, uh, uh, South Africa or, or in this case, Israel? I'm curious if, if you can talk a little bit about the history of that kind of organizing alliance building with other, you know, progressives? You know, this is such an important question. And there is a guy in Illinois who's written a major book about the Longshoremen and Warehouse Workers Union and their history mm -hmm. of doing work against apartheid. And some of this goes back to those that split in the labor movement going way back between those unions that were left and broad and looking at the big picture and those unions that were just simply concerned about making more money for their membership. The split between the so-called left-oriented unions and the conservative AFL unions, the CIO unions versus the AFL. I, I, another thing was the role of the Co Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, the CBTU that grows out of some of those progressive unions. Uh, one, for example, that contributed mightily throughout this time was the United Auto Workers Union, uh, the uh, District 65 of the distributive workers. There were particular union leaders, many of them black, who made tr signal contributions to this whole history. I can't talk about this without talking about the great leader um, out of the distributive workers in New York, uh, Charlie, no, not Charlie Hayes, that was, he was the meat cutters union, but uh, uh, Robinson, uh, I can't remember his first name. He, I remember sitting with him and say, he, I said to him, yes, your union's monies are in Chase Bank. And he said, our money is in that damn Chase. He picked up the phone, one phone call. He said, get our money out of that bank. I want it out by the end of this week. And they took decisive actions. There were organizations of labor people who 
studied the South Africa thing and some who went over and did things in countries around South Africa supporting uh, the South African trade union movement that was very involved in the struggle, COSATU. And then there were those unions that to this day still have very good relations. But on the other hand, there was the CIA's interference in, 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 in trying to direct the unions in a way that would support the ongoing uh, paramountcy and continued control by Western capitalist countries. And they were trying to use the labor movement in a way to do that. And there were big fights over this question within the labor movement. Uh, but there were also great trade unionists who, who made this, them lose this fight in the end. Um, I'm, I'm going to toss it to Alex in just a second because um, we're going to introduce some of the respondents. Um, but I wanted to note something from the chat, a couple things from the chat. My brother, Jason Ferrer, mentions a book, Peter Cole's book, Dock Worker Power, Race and Activism in Durban and San Francisco. Great read. Um, and Richie from the chat also has a question about on this on this point around, around divestment campaigns. Do you still see divestment campaigns as as effective today? I, I, I am I'm part of, I was one of the first people to sign the divestment campaign from Israel. Uh, the, the whole, and I, I note the tremendous punishments that people doing the divestment campaigns have had to face, much more than we faced. Mm -hmm. I'd be under the jail if I'd had to have the kind of stuff uh, that they have had to contend with. My, Palestinian and Jewish brothers and sisters that are rejecting Zionism and, and US support to Israel. And Israel, you know, we gotta remember, Israel played an incredible role making South African apartheid state be very powerful. They helped as much as any other country, Israel did, to make South Africa a nuclear power. People should never forget that. And so I think that the current divestment campaign is very critical. And I would say though, that I think one of the failures has been to link it enough to African-American campaigns to, I know that individually and as groups, many of the Palestinian students are very linked to African-American progressives who have gone to Israel, done tours backward and forward, all of that is very true, but I think the other thing is to have the, when they take the step of trying to get a divestment from an institution, they need to make sure they have all the support of African-American and Latino and Asian institutions and organizations in that particular setting so that they aren't just doing it by themselves. There's wonderful work that these Palestinian students who were very brave have done on this question, but we've got much, much work, more work to do on this. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, Alex. Yes. Um, I know we have quite a few questions kind of building up in the chat, uh, but like we said earlier, we've also um, asked some folks who are part of the spade work this time around to share some of their reflections about what you share, Prexy. So right now we're gonna invite up a day um, a Tischinger uh, to go ahead and share some reflections. And I think a day also has a question as a part of that too. Great. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I thought I lost this, it was just switching gear. Um, and I will share, do you want me to share my screen, Alex, or just read it? Um, I think you can just read it. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Ade Tushagar, and I am with the Safe Return Project located in Richmond, California. We're an organization made up of formerly incarcerated individuals and their allies working to strengthen the relationship of people coming home from incarceration with the broader community. We understand that breaking the cycle of incarceration and crime will take positive leadership by formerly incarcerated residents contributing 
to the greater community as we carry out critical participatory action research, grassroots community organizing and policy advocacy. And that is to build community power and to foster healing by putting the people closest to the pain of inequity at the center of the movement for first chances. What resonated with me and the apartheid campaign was the divestment strategies. And that's because the approach from multiple directions was successful. It had clear demands, it had coordinated actions, including corporations ready to stop the flow of money and the labor unions ready to organize their dollars. I connect with this strategy. I connected this strategy to my city of Richmond, California, um, where we believe we have a city budget that's morally unbalanced currently, where the police budget is allocated 40 plus more of the funds. The community organized for close to a year and came up with solutions to the budget that reflected the values that we as a community hold. Through my work, I've been participating in bringing community voices to the table and working on the budget subgroup task force that's been tasked to reallocate $67 million funding into our community for services and programs and alternatives to policing programs. Our community believes that divesting from police budget and investing in community services and programs is the way that we want to move towards forward as we transition into our new systems where everyone is getting what they need, including protections afforded within our laws. And I can see similarities that the student strategies used in divesting from this that do not serve the community into things that do. Thank you very much for allowing me this time to present. And I'd like to thank all of the people that continue to be fearless. And most of all, shout out to all my safe return family and the Bay Area. Thank you. Thank you, Ade. Alex, can I just say one quick thing? I, I, I so salute Ade because I have long wanted to work in Richmond because I've heard such wonderful things about the work that has gone on in Richmond. And I hope that she will take a look at the work that was been done around Gulf Oil and Chevron which were very involved in supporting Portuguese colonialism in Angola. And I remember work done connecting people to uh, protesting against those two companies in the Richmond area. And I totally support the, the effort to try to break the cycle of uh, people investing in those companies that are continuing incarceration and supporting patterns and institutions that do incarcerating. It's, it, I, I'm just saying that they're working in a tradition of a long history of Richmond and it's made Richmond a very famous place already. Yes. Um, I wanna share two questions, one of which is from a day. Uh, so the first question is what role did religion play in the struggle during apartheid, especially for the South Africans who didn't belong to a church. Uh, and then the second question that we have is, how did the movement navigate multiracial work in the US? Um, what were the tensions and difficulties in doing this? Some of this is uh, best addressed in uh, a very um, there's a wonderful book called No Easy Victories. It's obtainable and there's a website with it. The question of the racial tensions is talked about in that book, No Easy Victories. And I think the, the, the big, uh, there, were no, there was no boasting, no, nobody told lies. There was no not confronting tensions and issues and talking about them. That was very much a part of it. I think another part of it was there was no discriminating against people based on religious orientation, whether people were religious or they weren't religious, what type of religion they had. Those were not uh, guide stones as to whether people could participate or not. It was uh, very open to different people from different faiths all that was asked was that people would be consistent and respectful of other 
ways that people contributed. Um, I, and I think in this respect, we were very much influenced by some of the extraordinary church people that we saw come to the United States. People like Bishop Tutu, the famous Nobel Peace Prize winner, but also people like Alan Bosak, the uh, leader of the United Democratic Front, one of the leaders, uh, <coughs> a figure not so well known, or a man like Frank Chicani, also not a known figure, but we knew that many of the religious leaders in South Africa were paying the ultimate price and some paid with their lives to participate in those parts of the struggle that they could. In fact, there were some who even said that South Africa had crossed what they called the, the, the kind of boundary line and that their principles said that they could participate in even acts of violence to try to end the apartheid system, just like some people did when Nazism was around and there was a movement to get rid of Hitler. So they felt that there was that moment in South Africa. So we met religious people who, though they may not have had the guns themselves in their hands, we met religious people who said it was consistent with their beliefs to, for instance, transport guns. I remember going once to a nunnery in a part of the east coast of South Africa and meeting with nuns who had to decide if it was if, if it was all right with their own principled beliefs to hide guerrilla fighters who were involved in the armed struggle. And many of them decided it was all right. And so I think when you meet people who are like that, it helps you be very clear about what you believe too. And we did a lot of that. And I think there's many people who were part of the, all over the United States, who you may not even know yeah. that they were part of the anti-apartheid struggle, who are just quietly working away, based, grow, having grown out of that into other struggles. That's, that's a tremendous answer. Um, I wonder if, Alex, if you want to introduce our next respondent, um, and then we'll get back to the uh, questions from the chat. Yes. Um, next up, we'll have Shamaya Bird, who is also based in Chicago uh, with Seoul, Southsiders Organized for Unity and Liberation. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Shamaya with Seoul. Uh, south side of Chicago, born and raised. Um, Soul is a faith-based grassroots organization who believes that our faith, um, we are called by our faith to fight justice for all, especially those who are historically marginalized. Um, our mission is to assist low-income people of color in Chicago, South Chicago, and the suburbs, uh, then leverage that power for them to fight in their own interest and liberation. One of the things that resonated with me the most um, was allyship and just building um, that power with different institutions and one of the campaigns that my organization Soul is working on right now um, is Budget for Black Lives. And that's a divest, invest community. There's, um, a, I guess I should say a more national campaign just around defund the police. And so um, as you were speaking, Mr. Nesbitt about allyship, it just resonated with me and how we go about um, building allyship. But one thing you said in particular um, was black leadership. And I think that's important to lift up and emphasize um, in the fight for liberation for black people and for marginalized people and how important that black leadership is. So I definitely appreciated that. And I, I did, have one question 
um, if I have time to ask. Um, it's just around, um, I guess it's more of an extension of what you've already just expressed around religion. But um, with my organization being a faith-based, faith-based organization, we do work with many different um, congregations. And so I just want um, want to ask if you could explain a little bit more about allyship with different congregations and, and how that was um, in this fight against anti-apartheid as far as um, bigger or bigger like congregations and then more local um, in Chicago, especially. Thank you very much, Shemai. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I, I'm very, I know Seoul, uh, I, uh, though I don't live anymore. I only moved from Chicago about a year ago and was very, very active and, and very close to a lot of people that, and I think I have met you before, Shemaya. I'm not sure of that, but I want to say that I think one of the things that uh, Chicago affords more than any other city that I know is the opportunity for people from different faith traditions to stand in solidarity with other people of other faith traditions from other parts of that city. For instance, let me give a concrete example. The shooting recently of that Latino brother, that young Latino brother who had raised his arms, had no weapons, and the police blew him away. It strikes me that that's a moment that religious leaders of different faith traditions could should stand out and say, I am, I can't remember his name. I am, was his name Tony? I think his name was Adam. Adam, Adam Toledo. And Adam Toledo, I am Adam Toledo. That an exercise, a manifestation of black leadership would be that black religious leader leading a black congregation, let's say on the far south side, who says to his congregation, I am Adam Toledo. Because that's the way we stand in solidarity with each other, particularly in a history, in a city, which has a history, a proven history, of playing off different oppressed groups against each other. Yeah. That's been a proven history of the city of Chicago and how it administers that city. And I think it could be such a powerful statement to have a number of black religious leaders say, I am Adam Toledo. That's the way we're gonna win this thing, I think. I'm going to jump back into the questions. We have a really interesting question that actually is not specific to the divestment campaign. It's, it's more broadly speaking to organizing skills. And we have a lot of organizers in training, a lot of budding organizers, probably some of my students from my organizing class are here today who might want to get into this work long term. And the question is, what's one of the most effective ways to get ordinary people to care about and support your cause. And it reminds me just of the question that I ask all organizers, what, what are the skills that translate um, across decades, across generations? What, what are the skills that an organizer has to have to communicate to regular folk about these important issues? So what, what would you kind of teach an organizer around their skills? I think that's an excellent question. And the first skill that, the first skill I think that we have to have is listening. How do we listen? And out of that listening comes our capacity to be able to respond to people in a way in which we are not leading or manipulating them, but following their concerns and wedding their concerns to our involvement and action. I think another skill is how do you convey things 
how do you convey information to people without intimidating them, yeah. without scaring them, without uh, overwhelming them? And I think that part of that is the ability to say things quietly but consistently and not scare people. People are very, it's, it's, a, it's a country that people are scared to death in. Yeah. Every aspect of life in America scares the hell, and particularly now, particularly now. So we have to develop greater skill at listening to people, greater skill at consistently presenting our information in a way that's not intimidating. And then lastly, by our example, how we conduct our own lives is very, very important. And, 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 and that's especially important in this country. You know, um, people pay very close attention to how you treat other people. For example, how men relate to women. There, 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 there's a horrible history in our movement in this country of male uh, macho behavior on all levels. And to change that, I think you, this new generation has done leaps and bounds more than what we did in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so that it's behoven, it's, it, we, we uh, older, uh, what is, what's that expression, young brothers and sisters, we use old school. Old school people like me have to be very, very respectful, very careful of how we deliver any discussion. Because there's so many ways that your generation has much more capacity to communicate with each other than what we did. And I think we have to be very respectful of that. Respect, respect is a fundamental. Mm -hmm. It's a fundamental way that we have to develop all the possible ways we can say to people, we respect you. Thank you. That's a great question. Great answer. Alex has another question, I think, from the chat. Yeah, we're, we're down to our last few questions. Um, uh, this question I'm going to ask actually came up in slightly different ways a couple of times, but I'm going to read this one specifically. Um, the question is, what practices of personal or self-care and community collective care is needed for long distance running? Um, uh, and, and there's a couple comments around organizers that are burnt out. So what tips, best practices or lessons do you have around both self-care and community care? Um, for folks who are entering the work knowing that it is gonna be long-term work? Uh, I think there are, besides what I just was saying about respect, particularly from men towards women and towards people who are maybe another sexual orientation, all these are things that my generation has had to learn that your generation is much better at. I don't think we sing enough. We don't sing. And I think that song is an important way of sustaining one's energy and beliefs. Song and poetry, uh, I, I, I was very much, my mother was very close friends to Gwendolyn Brooks, the great, great poetess from Chicago. So in my family, we read poetry to each other at every meal. Every meal, somebody presented a poem. And there was no looking down on poetry and song. And so I don't think we sing enough and we don't recite enough poetry to each other. And it's one of the, in all those liberation movements that I worked with, including some I didn't work with, like the Vietnamese struggle, poetry was everywhere. 
I don't think that's accidental. I think often poetry incorporates our best values. And so reciting these poems to each other, writing poetry for each other is a way of perpetuating and continuing, extending those values. And I think one of the greatest value, you know, is this thing Che Guevara, the great Cuban revolutionary. He, he, he wrote once, the revolutionary is motivated by the highest feelings of love. Well, I do think that's important. And I don't think we should be fearful of it. And the churches often and religious leaders propel us forward to articulate that. But I don't think we need to wait for them to articulate that. And that loving one another is an important component of our capacity to continue going. We aren't gonna get monetary awards. We don't get, you aren't gonna be, you aren't gonna be a Jay-Z with lots of money from being an activist. But what you will get is the undying alliance, allegiance, and respect of people and of long generations of people, you know? And I think that's what we have to aim for is much more ways of gathering that love force. And I don't mean it necessarily, I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm not talking about a, a, a soapy, emotional love. I'm talking about a, an allegiance love that is important to sustain our ability to do the long distance work and keep our heads high and our shoulders strong to, to sustain ourselves. Thank you for that answer. Um, that, I, that reminds me of a question I wanted to ask earlier and from the chat about kind of the current moment. And, and it's, uh, I'm just curious what you think are some of the, the exciting things happening in organizing right now, organizing anywhere in the world, frankly, but anywhere that you feel there's impact and potential, something to be built upon um, from your experience as an organizer and someone who's still active where do you see kind of the hot spots, the, the interesting organizing that's happening today around what issues, what organizations? I will clearly, I think one of them is, one of the greatest ones is around the whole issue of Black Lives Matter. That in fact, we're saying much more than that. That it's Black, it's all lives matter, but it's our version of all lives matter. It's not the white supremacist counter to that. It's saying, most oppressed have been black people and indigenous people and Asian people, <coughs> Asian poor working people. But that out of that, we're saying we recognize the interrelationship and the, the uh, interlinkedness, if there's such a word, of our struggles one to the other. And so we teach each other all the time. And I think that's one of the most exciting things that's going on. I am so impressed at seeing generations of white people, some old, some very young, generations of black people who are embracing those white people in very dangerous situations. You know, in the midst of this, struggle that this, that there are legislatures that have the gall to instrumentalize people taking their cars to mow people down. The gall to do that is such a callous comment about this country and its values. It's worse than like a shotgun. It's like taking your car and making it an MR rifle. And I'm impressed with all the young people who, despite that, are, are for fearlessly going out and facing that. And that moment 
I don't see them as black or white. I just see them as fearless. It's a new color. It's an admirable color. I, I, I want to see grandchildren. I want to see grandchildren who grow into that color of the fearlessness of asserting what their values really are. Well, Alex and I, I think, have a couple of closing remarks, and then I, I um, want to preview next week as well. Um, Alex, do you want to jump in or? Um... Um, yeah, I would just say that this has been um, just a really wonderful conversation, and I appreciate you um, being here and sharing with us. Uh, when you started the conversation um, with the statement that this is a uh, a long run and not a sprint. That was one of the first uh, kind of pieces of information that my first mentor shared with me when I started organizing. Uh, and she said, you're, you're entering a marathon and not a sprint. Um, so it was um, uh, really warming and a good reminder to kind of start this conversation off. Um, and I think some of the, the pieces later in the conversation that you were speaking to around um, the sustainability of our movement being in and love and respect. Um, and, and also what I heard a lot of you saying is growth, right? The, the arc of um, growth and development um, and stronger, sharper uh, analysis among generations just feels really um, like a really good place to, to land and end. Um, thinking about the Freedom School and some of the folks that we have uh, as, as participants in that cohort, uh, really are the new generation of organizing. Um, and so I'm glad that they also got the opportunity to be a part of this conversation and, and, and share some of their reflections. So thank you. Thank you. It's a great, great pleasure to hear your comments and very invigorating for me too. I just want to echo that. Um, and I love the fact, Prexy, that you were able to weave this really interesting history. By the way, launching this Freedom School series um, the next 10 weeks is a really great start in weaving a, a history, a complex history, but a history that um, you were not, you know, you didn't shy away from kind of updating us. You didn't shy away from making this contemporary. You kept the, you know, it was like sort of, this is one long, back to that theme, right? Uh, Vincent Harding used to write about there's a river, right? There's a sometimes movements ebb and flow. Sometimes they have great force. Sometimes they're at a trickle. The river metaphor is really interesting in movement work. But I love the fact that you were able to kind of weave this history and bring us up to the present as well and, and, and see this sort of this long continued struggle. So I, I very, very much appreciate um, uh, this lesson. And this is, we're going to get a lot more of this in, in the coming weeks, but it's such a, a great start. So thank you, Prexy. Appreciate it very much. Well, I appreciate both you and Alex very much. And I hope to be sitting in the school as much because uh, I, I want to be informed about each session so I can continue. And I also want to thank our interpreters, uh, th those two wonderful sisters that I only got to talk to a little bit, but I know what it invaluable role you are contributing. Um, it is a river. Vincent Harding used to say, there is a river. And I think one of the things we're seeing now is that river like, is like the Mississippi. It ain't going away. It, it's staying right there in the heart of this country. Yeah, that's right. Alex, do you um, maybe want to get a word from our sponsors and then we'll go back <laughs> by talking about um, future events. Yes, yes, important work from the sponsors. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone um, for being here and being engaged and active in the conversation. Uh, if you were inspired by what you heard in this session and wanna keep it going, please go to the link that's gonna pop up in the chat right now and make a donation. Um, and the donations and contributions that you make will go towards the development of organizers through Spades work. Um, and so, like we said earlier, Spades Work is a new national organizing training program to nurture the next generation of, of organizers of color. Um, for example, like Ade and Shamaya, uh, who shared in today's session, um, those two uh, organizers are uh, members and participants uh, and organizers in our first cohort of Spade Work. 
And I think we have a slide for next week's session. So if that's possible to, to put that up there. Next Tuesday, May 4th, um, from 10 to 12 Pacific Standard Time, but wherever you're coming to us, um, we're gonna have it. We're gonna profile a campaign led by native groups to prevent the construction of the Keystone XL pipeline. So we're gonna find out more about the ups and downs of that campaign. I mentioned earlier, we're going back 50, 60 years and we're going back three or four or five years. So it's like a really kind of interesting series of uh, movement stories that really try to lift up these lessons, but also energize us. Um, find out more about that campaign. And that eventually led to the declaration of this year by President Biden to halt the construction of that pipeline. It's, uh, it'll be led by a good friend of ours, um, Judith LeBlanc from Native Action Project. She's also director of the Native Organizers Alliance. Uh, we're really, really looking forward to that. Um, we have a week nine. Alex, you want to talk about week nine? Because uh, we, I'm going to give you a little preview of the other weeks, but there's a special session that you all are going to be able to, to help us out with. Yeah. Um, so if you're looking at kind of the schedule for the sessions upcoming, um, you'll see week nine is listed as an open session, and we did that purposefully. Um, the reason why is because we actually want whatever that session is going to be about to come from you all. Um, so week nine is June 21st of Freedom School. And so if you have a suggestion of a campaign uh, that specifically bent the arc of history, whether it was in this country or somewhere else around the world, um, and or if you have folks who have intimate connection to that struggle and that fight, um, please let us know by sending an email to admin at spadework.school. Um, and then if you're gonna contribute and make suggestions for that, just make sure to do that uh, by the deadline, which is May 31st. That's right. And just to kind of give you a preview of some of those other uh, sessions that we have set up already next week, the the discussion around the native campaign against big oil. Um, but we're also gonna look at the Justice for Janitors campaign. We're gonna look at a, a really interesting recent mutual aid organizing story from Puerto Rico. We are going to have a, a, a timely, very timely recollection of a prison abolition campaign in the coming week. Um, we have organizing stories from the Philippines, from Ecuador. We are gonna get a really great inside look um, from movement participants. Again, all these are from movement participants um, from the great, uh, the great boycott, the UFW great boycott. And, and to close, the last session we'll have at the end of June, and I know this is looking way ahead, but at the end of June, week 10, we're going to um, look at Freedom Summer. Freedom Summer, where actually, you know, wasn't the beginning of the creation of Freedom Schools, but Freedom Schools were a big part of the Southern Civil Rights Movement and the effort by SNCC, especially in local communities. And we're going to have a SNCC organizer, uh, a former SNCC organizer, come on and talk about Freedom Summer from 1964. And historian, the great Charles Payne, is going to help lead that discussion along with the organizer. So we've got some really great sessions coming up. I, again, I want to thank Prexy Nesbitt for his outstanding um, presentation today and answering these great questions. Thank you to the participants for, for asking terrific questions. I wish we'd gotten to all of them. Thank you, um, Naira, Naira and, and, and Ale, and, and of course, my, my co-host, um, Alex. We appreciate you all. It's on to episode two next week. Um, thank you all. We'll see you then. Take care. Take care.